idea of vaccinations is to protect against disease. So do they work, and if so, how effective are they? The eradication of smallpox is always hailed as one of the great triumphs of modern medicine. And yet, in spite of the extensive international efforts documented in the BBC Pain, Pus and Poison documentary mentioned earlier, only one-tenth of the global population was ever vaccinated to smallpox. Dr Glenn Detman comments on this, saying that it is pathetic and ludicrous to say that we vanquished smallpox with vaccines when only 10% of the population was ever vaccinated. The reason given for this in the documentary is that you don't need to vaccinate everyone as vaccinated people effectively create a firewall around outbreaks. There will be more on this topic of the importance of herd immunity later. There are countless examples of smallpox outbreaks in highly vaccinated communities, just a few of which are offered here. After the first compulsory vaccination law was introduced in England in 1853, the death rate from smallpox increased tenfold from a maximum of 2,000 every two years to over 23,000 in the years 1870 and 1871. This still remains the most deadly outbreak of the disease on record, and it spread throughout Europe to the countries where large-scale vaccination had been practised. During this epidemic, 125,000 people died of smallpox in Germany, and all had been vaccinated, as carefully documented. As a result of this outbreak, the vaccination laws were enforced even more stringently until people noticed that the vaccination was providing no protection and began to suspect that it may have been part of the problem or even the cause. The medical profession has repeatedly refused to conduct controlled trials into the efficacy and safety of vaccinations, deeming such trials to be unethical by refusing the control group the supposed protection afforded by vaccinations. In the absence of such research, we have uncontrolled situations such as that which arose in the city of Leicester in England at the end of the 19th century. In 1871, the English manufacturing city of Leicester, with a population at the time of 200,000, achieved 95% vaccination rates against smallpox, and yet it suffered disproportionately severely from smallpox mortalities when compared to the populations of other unvaccinated cities, including London, which was very unsanitary at the time. In the 20 years that followed, the good citizens of Leicester opposed further vaccinations until the smallpox vaccination rate fell to just 5% of newborns. In fact, what came to be known as the Keithley Seven stood for election on an anti-vaccination platform in the city and when elected and openly defiant of the national government, they were imprisoned in York Castle in 1876. By 1885, Leicester had 3,000 people awaiting prosecution for refusing vaccination and a mass rally was attended by possibly as many as 100,000 people as shown here. Leicester chose to tackle the problems of these epidemics by improving hygiene and sanitation and there is more on this subject too later. Against a background of dire warnings from the medical profession, any isolated cases of smallpox in Leicester failed to spread, and the city enjoyed the lowest mortality rates in England. In a 1951 book by Lily Lote entitled The Truth About Vaccination and Immunisation, she says that Leicester's experience during the past 50 years makes nonsense of the claims of the pro-vaccinists. When her population was thoroughly vaccinated, she suffered severely from smallpox. As vaccination declined to 1% of the infants born, smallpox disappeared altogether. And in a 1912 book by J.T. Biggs on the subject, he commented that Leicester is, and has been for the last 20 years, the least vaccinated town in the kingdom. Its average population from 1873 to 1894 was about two-thirds of that of the army during the same period. Yet the smallpox deaths in the army and navy were 37 per million, those of Leicester under 15 per million. This quote from Sir Leon Playfair in 1884 said that, in the epidemic of 1871-72, there died 14,808 persons of smallpox in London, of whom 11,174 were vaccinated. In fact, as the citizenry of the UK generally lost faith in the vaccination programme, and half the population either refused or omitted to be vaccinated, the smallpox mortality subsequently fell to the lowest on record. In 1872, on the other side of the world, in Japan, compulsory smallpox vaccination was introduced, 
and the country went on to experience annual increases in smallpox. Within 20 years, they had accumulated nearly 30,000 smallpox deaths and every single one had been vaccinated. In the early 1900s, the Philippines had a drive to vaccinate their population, with 8 million people receiving 24 million vaccine doses. They achieved a vaccination rate of 95% and the death rate from smallpox quadrupled shortly thereafter. Dr William Howard Hay of Buffalo, New York had this to say, We have no proof of the boasted effectiveness of any form of antitoxin, vaccine or serum. If the record of vaccination in the Philippines alone were ever to become a matter of general knowledge, it would finish vaccination in the whole country. After three years of the most rigid vaccination, where every Filipino had been vaccinated between one and six times, there occurred the severest epidemic of smallpox that the islands had ever seen, with a death rate running in places to over 70%, and in all, well over 60,000 deaths. After witnessing the disaster of smallpox vaccination elsewhere, France had rejected the policy until German occupation during World War II brought with it compulsory mass vaccination. Shortly after most French children had been vaccinated, the incidence of diphtheria increased tenfold to 150,000 cases. Whereas in Norway, which did not adopt vaccination, there were only 50 diphtheria cases. More recent examples include the country of Oman, which achieved complete vaccination of its population in 1989, followed just six months later by a widespread polio outbreak. In 1953, the League of Nations Health Report reluctantly admitted that, in spite of the great efforts made by the health authorities in promoting vaccination, smallpox is not on the point of extinction. Dr Joseph Swan commented in his book The Vaccination Problem that these figures speak for themselves and eloquently proclaim the utter futility of vaccination as a preventive or mitigant of smallpox. All doctors have been subject to the received propaganda on this subject, and so those that have realised the truth have done so through personal experience and individual study. One such was Dr Elsie Carter, who commented that, in looking over the history of vaccination for smallpox, I am amazed to learn of the terrible deaths from vaccination, amputations of arm and leg, foot and mouth disease, tetanus, septicemia and cerebrospinal meningitis. Estimates from government sources claim that vaccines offer anywhere from 80% protection for chickenpox, in this case from the UK National Health Service, up to a confident 99% guarantee from Public Health Wales of protection following two measles vaccines. But this isn't borne out by the data, and it's not just smallpox. The history of vaccination is littered with the failure of vaccines to prevent all kinds of diseases. Consider the following few examples. The first example is of a large outbreak of mumps in Kansas in the winter of 1988, which affected mostly schoolchildren, 97.6% of whom had been vaccinated. Then this report of an outbreak of mumps in Tennessee in 1991, in which 98% of those affected had been vaccinated. Turning our attention to measles, this refers to 18 outbreaks where 77% of those affected had previously been immunised. In the first half of 1989, there were over 7,335 cases of measles reported to the US Centers for Disease Control, 80% of whom had been vaccinated. In this example, four health workers exposed to patients with measles contracted the disease in spite of having been vaccinated, three of them twice. In 1989, the CDC reported, among school-aged children, measles outbreaks have occurred in schools with vaccination levels of higher than 98%. They have occurred in all parts of the country, including areas that had not reported measles for years. The CDC even reported a measles outbreak in a documented 100% vaccinated population. With regard to pertussis, in Kansas in 1986, 90% of 1,300 cases were vaccinated, as were 72% of people involved in an outbreak in Chicago in 1993. 
And with regard to the BCG vaccination for tuberculosis, after 72 children died in Lübeck, Germany in 1930 after vaccination, the first well-controlled trials of the vaccine took place over a period of decades. Involving just over a quarter of a million people divided equally into vaccine and control groups, the results showed no evidence of protection, with the vaccinated group experiencing slightly more TB than the unvaccinated group. In spite of this finding, the BCG vaccine continued to be used, as though documented evidence of its ineffectiveness failed to shake the belief of the medical profession in the efficacy of vaccinations. The fact is that many infectious diseases such as smallpox declined in unvaccinated populations also. In fact, smallpox outbreaks were checked by the cessation of inoculation and not by the introduction of vaccination. And illnesses for which there is no vaccination, such as scarlet fever and typhoid, have also declined. So are these vaccine failures just documented unusual or do they indicate that vaccination may provide no protection at all and worse still actively introduce and perpetuate historic illnesses in today's communities? To answer that question we need to take a look at the case of polio in vaccination myth number three that vaccination controlled polio.